Robert McKenzie reporting. The date was October 17, 1956. The place, Calder Hall on the northwest coast of England, about 300 miles from London. It was a windy, wild day, but it was a time and a place for the making of history. Her Majesty the Queen opens the first full-scale atomic power station in the world. Today, as power from Calder Hall begins to flow into the national grid, all of us here know that we are present at the making of history. I congratulate all those who have shared in this fine project, both those who conceived and planned the industrial application of atomic energy in this way, and those who have worked to see their plans fulfilled. And I hope this occasion will be an inspiration and encouragement to all who will continue this exciting enterprise here and elsewhere. It is with pride that I now open Calder Hall, Britain's first atomic power station. As electricity flows from this atomic power station into the homes and factories of Britain, it is both a moment of achievement and a point of departure. For Calder Hall was first planned three years ago as a dual purpose plant to produce electricity and to produce plutonium for Britain's weapons program. Now it is seen as the forerunner of an impressive program of improved atomic power stations. Power is the key to a nation's prosperity. Experts differ as to how long the world can rely on its resources of coal and oil and gas and hydropower, which it's using at ever increasing rates. But in Britain, the problem has had to be faced sooner than in most countries. Coal has always been Britain's main source of power, but the demand for it is going to double in the next 10 years. And with many mines already difficult to work, a new guarantee of prosperity had to be found. Oil has to be imported. Natural gas is non-existent. Hydroelectric sources are small. Britain has therefore decided to stake her future on atomic energy. In the next 10 years, she'll be building 15 new atomic power stations. By 1975, and perhaps sooner, the output of power from these stations will be enough to meet all her increasing demands for electricity. It's a development as important as the harnessing of steam. To discuss this exciting prospect with me, here is Miss Mary Goldring. Miss Goldring is feature writer for one of the leading British weekly magazines and the author of a forthcoming book on atomic energy. Now, Miss Goldring, inevitable question. How does one of these atomic power plants like Calder Hall actually work? How long have we got? Two minutes. Oh, my. Well, look, let's cut all the science out of this entirely and look at it as a straightforward piece of engineering. Now, we've got a diagram here to help us. This is your uranium fuel. When you bring the rods together, you get a tremendous release of heat, and it's the job of the engineer to turn that heat into electricity. All right, so far? Mm -hmm. Well, the way they do this is to pump gas up through the reactor and out into the boilers. In the boilers, it raises steam, the steam goes to the turbines in the ordinary way. And look, the only thing you've got to remember is that instead of coal or oil in a conventional power station, you are using a completely new fuel. Your fuel is uranium, otherwise well, the same. Well, now, you've mentioned uranium and this great release of energy. Will the thing blow up? No, it won't. This is only natural uranium. It won't explode whatever you do to it. It's the hardest thing in the world to get an atom bomb to go off. Well, it's obvious, Miss Golding, that Britain needs this new source of power, but these stations look expensive. Now, can Britain afford to build them? They are, at the moment, dearer to build than ordinary power stations, and they're, but their costs are coming down. And even with a relatively inefficient type of station like Calder, and let's face it, scientists call this a Model T reactor, the cost of electricity doesn't look as if it's going to be much dearer than from ordinary stations using coal or oil we've got quite a good prospect that it's going to be cheaper soon. Now, would this be true, say, in the United States, for example, where coal is easier to get at and there's a good deal of oil and natural gas? Well, frankly, no. But you've got to remember there are parts of the United States, I think New York State and possibly parts of New England, where they're paying at least as much for their electricity today as we are in Britain. Now, Miss Goldring, where do the Russians come in on all this? I know they claim to have invented everything, and they claim, I believe, to have the first atomic power plant. Is this uh, true? 
Yes, they have, in a very strictly literal sense. They've got a small power station outside Moscow. It is only one twentieth the size of Calder, and the Russians themselves admit that it's very uneconomic. They haven't got a big station at all. Miss Goldring, what about other peaceful uses of atomic energy? Is Britain planning to use it in submarines or ships or aircraft? Well, frankly, we're way behind the United States on this. We've done a little bit of work on atomic submarines, and we're stepping this up now. We've done almost nothing on aircraft. But you know, that's not the end of the story. There are a good many other peaceful uses. For instance, you can put materials into an atomic reactor and you make them radioactive. Now, the effect of that is very much as if they had a little portable radio transmitter inside them. They send out signals and you can pick these up. For instance, you can trace substances going through a body. You can trace them going through an oil pipe. Uh, you can even pick them up in an estuary if you've been dredging it and you carried the silt right out to sea, you can tell whether or not it's coming back. There, oh, there are hundreds and hundreds of these kind of examples. Wow. Can we go right back to the power stations for a moment? When you've finished with your uranium, what you've got left amounts to an atomic ash. Now, this is, is virulently radioactive. And it looks as if we can use this radioactivity to do a good many jobs in industry that at the moment we only do under great heat and pressure. Now, th this may sound a bit academic, but it affects the oil refineries, the rubber industry, plastics and chemicals, there's a whole raft of them. And it is probably going to come right into our daily lives. When you think that you can, well, I, I don't like to say you can, but you may be able to use this radioactivity to sterilize food, that is meat, milk, vegetables. It's a tremendously exciting prospect and, and we've no idea where it will end. An historian of Britain's atomic energy industry has observed that at the end of the war she had nothing but green fields and grey matter. In ten years of independent effort since then, she has put both to good use. A new industry has been built up from scratch. The factory at Springfields, where uranium ore from the Commonwealth is processed. The reactor at Windscale, producing plutonium for weapons. A temple of atomic technology. The vast gaseous diffusion plant at Capenhurst, working on the weapons program, a factory from the future. All over Britain, atomic research and practice is being pressed forward. Most of all at Harwell, near Oxford, where in 1946 there was set up the research establishment from which the organization of today has drawn its know-how and its inspiration. Here with me now is the director of Harwell, Sir John Cockroft. Sir John, all, uh, with his colleague Dr. Walton, was the first person to split the atom by artificial means as long ago as 1932. Now, tell me, Sir John, in your recent work at Har Harwell, what exactly is going on in those behind the mysterious walls? Well, I think the most important thing is that we do all the early work on new types of, of nuclear power stations. That is, we do the early studies on feasibility, we work on the technology of these systems in order to make sure uh, that they can be developed. In order to do this, we are equipped with a large number of small uh, atomic piles. We have a total of eight atomic piles in all at Harwell, and we um, started up the latest only a few days ago. In addition to that, we are the principal exporter of radioactive isotopes in the world, and we are all the time developing new uses for these radioactive isotopes. In addition to that, we do a good deal of more fundamental and long-term research work. Well, now, you drafted the early plans then for Calder Hall. That's right, we worked on it for two years at Harwell, yes. Well, now, have you other schemes apart from Calder Hall under, in operation? Yes, we have a number of new reactors we, we are studying. As one example, we are, the authority is now building in the north of Scotland what is called a fast reactor. This is an experimental a reactor of a type which might be important in large-scale uh, power generation 15 years from now. When you say fast reactor, what does that mean? Oh, well, this is a rather technical phrase. It's uh, really a reactor which has a very, very small volume and it works in a slightly different way from the very big corner hall. It would be very much smaller and at the same time would um, 
would produce power in the same way by the splitting of uranium atoms. But the important thing of, about the Dunray reactor is that it would use perhaps a hundred times less uranium than the coal hull type for a given amount of power. In other words, this is part of the process that you're working on all the time of trying to make this operation more efficient. More efficient and more economic, yes, that's right, yes, yes. We've been rather skating around the scientific theory behind all this, Sir John, and while I realize we can't possibly go into it in detail, there are two words that I think I'd like to have cleared up. One is fission, which we've heard a great deal about, and now the newer word fusion, which is being used in describing some of the experimental work. Yes, well, fission is, is simply the splitting up of uh, a uranium, a nucleus of a uranium atom into two uh, heavy pieces, uh, and that releases energy. But we can also release energy by joining together some of the light atoms. For example, we can join together, in principle, four atoms of hydrogen to form helium. And actually, this is what happens in the stars and in the sun. This is the source, of, main source of energy of the sun. So, in order to achieve this in practice, we would first of all um, take what is known as heavy water, which is found in ordinary water, and try to find means of raising this heavy water to a very high temperature. And by this, I mean a temperature of something like 100 million degrees, so it would be really very hot indeed. Um, well, this might sound to you a completely crazy project, because you think everything would melt, and the walls of glass walls and metal walls would melt in a fraction of a second, but it's not entirely crazy, as you might think. Uh, and if, if you can do that, does that mean that a, a cup of water contains a, a vast amount of energy? A vast it? amount of energy, that's right, yes. So that uh, mankind would really have a completely inexhaustible source of energy and wouldn't have to go anywhere except just locally to look for it. Well, now, are you working on this problem yourself? Yes, we are working on it, on it quite hard at, at Harwell. And um, it is the most fascinating field of research, but it is a very long-term research, and we think it would be quite a time before uh, this would be a major power source for the world. Nevertheless, um, we intend to go on working it very hard and, and we hope to produce some results. The significance of Calder Hall can be measured in so many ways. There's the purely practical consideration that you have a power station using not thousands of tons of coal a day, but one truckload of uranium in three years. And there's also the wider perspective stated by the Queen when she opened Calder Hall. For centuries past, visionary ideals and practical methods which have gone from our shores have opened up new ways of thought and modes of life for people in all parts of the world. It may well prove to have been among the greatest of our contributions to human welfare that we led the way in demonstrating the peaceful uses of this new source of power.